Well, first, welcome everyone, um, and especially Lori, of course, Lori Gruen, that will be our speaker today. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, let me start introducing myself. So I'm a junior fellow at the Animals and Biodiversity Program of the Global Research Network Think Tank, and I'm going to be the chair of our conversation with Lori today on the ground and future of ecofeminism. And this is going to be a first animal conversation um, of a series of conversations we are going to have on animal justice and animal politics uh, in all this academic year of 2021-2022. So um, the, the first thing I want to mention is that our conversation series will aim at being quite broad. We want to bring into the picture and put at the center fields like ecofeminism, critical race theory, critical disability studies, uh, critical animal studies, post-colonial theory, indigenous studies, all these fields and more. The idea is to put them at the center and see what intersections there are. And we are going to have wonderful speakers. The first one, of course, Lori Green. Um, let me explain a little bit about the structure of the session today. So we are go first going to cover a little bit about the history of ecofeminism quite briefly. And then we are going to sort of zoom into some of the key structuring ideas of the field and also on Lori's own work as she is a leading philosopher and a feminist scholar as well. And then in the last part of our conversation, it's going to be more oriented towards the future um, of ecofeminism as a field and also the discipline of critical animal studies. So this kind of first part of the conversation or our discussion should last around one hour. And then we will have around 30 minutes for questions and answers. Um, in the meantime, while Lori and I uh, discuss all these uh, matters, you can uh, ask questions on the YouTube live stream and also on the chat on Zoom for those of you who are uh, on Zoom as well on Twitter. You can follow us and perhaps uh, make some comments there as well. And with the structure out of the way, let me introduce our wonderful speaker today, uh, Lori Green. We are very, very fortunate to have you with us, Lori. Thank you for, for being here. And Lori is a leading scholar in animal studies and feminist philosophy, and the author and editor of over a dozen books, including Ethics and Animals, an introduction, critical terms for animal studies, entangled empathy, ethics of captivity, and ecofeminism, feminist intersections with other animals and the earth. Her work in practical ethics and political philosophy focuses on issues that impact those often overlooked in traditional ethical investigations. For example, women, people of color, incarcerated people and non-human animals. She is a fellow of the Hastings Center for Bioethics and was the founding chair um, of the Faculty Advisory Committee for the Center for Prison Education at Wesleyan University. Professor Gruen has documented the history of the first 100 chimpanzees in research in the United States, and has an evolving website that documents the journey to sanctuary of the remaining chimpanzee, chimpanzees in research lab, which is called The Last 1000, which is, by the way, as well, I believe her uh, Twitter handle, uh, The Last 1000. So Lori, welcome again, and thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to be the inaugural speaker in this year's it's, series. It's an honor to have you, and we are very, very happy to have you with us. So let's just start because we have so much to cover. I was saying to you before we were starting, well, let's see how this goes, because I have so many questions and so many that were left out because of time. I would like to ask you questions for hours on end. So <laughs> let's get to it. So as you know, Lori, um, our network is a global network. We have people coming from all sorts of backgrounds. So the first thing, is, uh, there are some of the people attending today the, our conversation that might never have heard the term ecofeminism. So could you explain us a little bit what is it, what is ecofeminism, and a bit about its inception bri briefly, to situate the talk basically. Right, so I'll try to be brief about what ecofeminism is. Ecofeminism is uh, a type of praxis, I would, I would say, that is its theory um, and activism that looks to undo uh, the forces of domination that we see as um, impacting the natural world, impacting non-human animals, and impacting um, various 
non-normative genders, primarily um, women is in its inception, um, but it's not uh, an exclusive kind of theory that's only about those who identify as women. Um, it is fundamentally concerned with the forces of domination, the way the forces of domination are structured um, to hold many, many people, the natural world and animals in a position of sort of fungibility, exploitability, um, exchange. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, ecofeminists look at this structure, um, primarily manifested as we see theoretically or conceptually through uh, what, what Karen Warren, the late Karen Warren and early ecofeminist thinker called value dualisms. Val Plumwood also, the late Val Plumwood, another really important um, ecofeminist scholar highlighted the way that the notion of so gender binary gender divisions, divisions between humans and animals, divisions between black and white, between culture and nature, um, that these binaries, these value dualisms are conceptually foundational in the mm -hmm. exploitation and um, domination of, of the weaker part of the what's thought to be the, the lesser part of the dualism. And so ecofeminists challenge that conceptual structure and also do that through activism. Um, mm -hmm. So trying to bring to light um, both practically and politically the way that this conceptual frame is harming um, so many people, billions and billions of animals and our planet. Wonderful, uh, very clear. So what the next question, I just wanted us to get into this history of ecofeminism, but from this, I'm going to just ask you uh, this question from a kind of twofold manner. One is the activist side and the intellectual one, because they are both combined. So perhaps it's good to ask in both. And I believe that it, it, it was initiated in the 1980s when animal um, feminists for animal rights was created. I think in 1981, it's the first organization that advocated for the rights of animals. Um, you explain all these things in your wonderful book, uh, Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersection with Other Animals, that we will get to that later. So could you perhaps give us a bit of that historical background in that epoch? Because also you lived it, you lived the 80s and 90s, which I find if you could tell us as well about your experience on that a little bit, I feel very curious about that. Yes, so um, just as is true with feminism more generally, um, where there's a variety of different types of feminism, there's mm -hmm. liberal feminism, there's black feminism, there's anarcho feminism, there's socialist feminism. Um, there's a variety of different ways of, of thinking about feminism and highlighting the sort of major issues that are of concern. And ecofeminists too, in those early days had different stripes, if you, if you will. Um, we had sort of a more liberal um, view of ecofeminism and the liberal view of feminism there is a notion that somehow if we recognize the value, you see the value dualism that I talked about and mm. the liberal view is, okay, let's bring all of the undervalued into the valued realm. Um, so socialist feminists and socialist ecofeminists are saying from the get-go, the, these dualisms serve a particular foundational purpose to create raw material for the production mm -hmm. and social reproduction of um, systems of power that privilege white men usually. Um, mm -hmm. And so the socialist um, feminists and socialist ecofeminists aren't interested in sort of just trying to fix up the system as it existed. And, th and then there were radical feminists. Um, and the radical feminists had a very different kind of view about structures of domination. Um, and there were radical ecofeminists also. Um, those, when I say radical feminists, I'm talking about sometimes they're also called cultural feminists, and the idea is that there's something specific to this gender division um, that, say, um, women see things differently than men see things, um, and we're clo or closer to nature. Um, that's uh, one strand. It's one of the one of the ways that um, ecofeminism and feminist for animal rights was influenced in a large way by um, a kind of 
his, historical lib, uh, radical feminism or cultural feminism. Um, but these things, and so I got into this early days in a somewhat skeptical way because mm -hmm. um, there was a, a volume that was out called Healing the Wounds. Um, and it had some beautiful um, writing about the ways in which um, nature can, can be a, a source of tremendous um, comfort and satisfaction in addition to just being a raw you know, resource. Um, but there was a little bit of an um, absence of political engagement in, for me anyway, in that early sort of more romanticized, I would say, understanding of ecofeminism. Unfortunately, um, that, uh, that one strand, it was only one strand, but that strand kind of was elevated into the 90s and early 2000s when that's what people thought of as ecofeminism, where mm -hmm. early, much more radical and political feminism was also influencing ecofeminism. Interesting. I mean, I feel inclined to ask you more about that, but I will not because, okay. <laughs> because I know that I really want us to get to the more conceptual side of things, perhaps. But something that I do want to mention is for people who might be new to the field, I strongly recommend all of you the chapter groundwork um, in the book, Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals on the Earth, which, by the way, Lori, I know that and we were talking about this before, that there is a new edition that is going to be published quite soon. Um, I just think it's the best place to go if one has never read about it, it's, it's great. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the new edition as well now. It's a good moment now talking about the history. Yeah, so, um, well, one of the things I wanna say is if anybody has more questions about the early history, if you wanna move on, just put them in the chat. I'm happy to answer yeah, exactly. any questions um, or, or send the questions however you want to send them. Um, Ecofeminism, um, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals in the Earth that I uh, co-edited with um, Carol Adams was originated mm -hmm. Um, at a conference that we held at Wesleyan University in Connecticut in the United States um, on the occasion of the death of Marty Keel. Marty Keel was the founder of Feminists for Animal Rights. She was a remarkable um, trendsetter, um, brilliant activist and wonderful person. And um, we decided, Carol and I decided when she passed away that we would have, hold a conference and the conference was so rich and exciting that we decided we should put a book together. The book has been really very well received. Um, and so we were asked to write a second edition and the second edition has a whole new section. Um, the, the book itself, it has, um, the original book had two sections, one on affect and one on context. And we'll talk a little bit about those ideas in a minute, I think. But um, the third, the second uh, edition has a third new section on climate. And we talk there, there's chapters that talk about both the climate that we live in, the climate catastrophe that we're facing, um, but, uh, but also the climate of reception for ecofeminist ideas. So there's also more of this history in that section um, as well. I'm just, I just, I know where I will ask more about the fact. Um, I was just not noting it. So now let's move now to this second part where, because we've already, we are already 15 minutes in, time flies. Um, and in this part, yes, I want to first, as we talked about this uh, in the email as well, the question of context. So I know that context in contrast to the kind of animal ethics advanced by people like Peter Singh and Tom Regan. In ecofeminism, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis, and you've already touched on this, on actual relationships, the positionality of a specific subjects in a specific geographies, different individuals, socioeconomic background and context, and so much more. This is something that has been very present, at least in all the ecofeminist literature I've read pretty much. It's always there, as it were, permeating and structuring that thinking. So could you perhaps unpack a little bit this difference, uh, these differences um, this, and why context is important and we should take it into account? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important question, Pablo, and I'm glad that we're gonna have a chance to talk about it. There's a lot that I could say, and I'm gonna try to say it um, in a, as brief a way as I can and as clear a way as I can. Um, but again, if, if people want me to be clearer, ask, please ask questions. So one of the ways of thinking about traditional animal ethics, which is just 
one version of um, a kind of framework of thinking about our sort of relations with the more than human world. Um, but one way to think about animal ethics is that it is um, designed to create universalizable general principles. Um, there's two different views. We often say Peter Singer and Tom Reagan. Um, Peter Singer is a utilitarian, a consequentialist. Tom Reagan was a deontologist or a rights theorist. Peter Singer is often thought of as the founder of animal rights. He doesn't believe in rights. There's a little mistake there. He actually believes that the only things that matter, the only things that matter are pain and pleasure. That is suffering and sort of good experiences. And that's all that's valuable. Um, he, it's terrific that he was able to bring the idea that animals also suffer into our conversation. It was absolutely monumental in the 1970s um, when he really got a lot of attention for that idea. And many people started to pay attention to the notion that animals suffer. So that was really important. Um, but one of the things that's wrong with that view is it doesn't pay attention to the particular beings that are suffering. So what you're trying to do as a utilitarian is to maximize good, pleasurable experiences and minimize bad, painful experiences. So technically, and I know this is a bit of a sort of reach, but at least conceptually or principally, if the people who kill and eat animal bodies get so much pleasure out of that, so much pleasure out of that, that it undoes the terrible suffering, um, the disruption in relationships, the disruption mm -hmm. in families, that that would be okay. I know that's a reach. I don't think anybody would enjoy it that much, but, the, but, the, but I use this example to highlight a really important difference and why it is that context matters. Because if we're all replaceable and we're just understood, me, my dogs, my friends who are peacocks, you know, my friends who are chimpanzees, we're all interchangeable in terms of the value that we have by virtue of how much pleasure we can have or how much pain we can avoid. Um, we really miss out on what I think of as the texture and sort of the basis of our ethical relationships. We're not just vehicles for utility. That's that's a, a distortion of you know pretty catastrophic sort. So that's one of the reasons context matters um, for ecofeminists is we're not going to look at each other as, as you know fungible, exchangeable, replaceable individuals. We each have a kind of our ways of being in the world that are valuable to us um, and that are valuable in our relationships with one another. And utilitarianism can't capture that. Rights view is a different view, and I'll be really brief on this one. The, the deontological view or the rights view um, is really one that sort of already sets up a diff like a conflict, right? I'm in conflict with you. And so I am going to assert my rights to demand that you do not interfere with me. And that's a really important thing as well. But there's so much more to who we are and what we're doing and our relationships with each other and with other animals that this setup is like, I'm an individual and I have a boundary of rights is not the fundamental framework that ecofeminists operate with. Um, we're we're, we pay attention not just to context, but the relationships that we're in um, with one another near and far um, in a whole web of what I call entanglement. So um, the rights view is very individualistic and very conflict focused. And there's so much, again, there's so much more to who we are and how our relationships operate. And so context matters for that reason. I, the, the only thing I wanted to add to what you've said, I agree with everything. Something that I've always felt is quite perverse, perhaps, about seeing as utilitarianism is that if a, an action, which are the ontological thinking would help us in some respects here, is wrong, we should, as it were, not even count that pleasure. So I've always, it makes no sense to me to think, oh, we are here harming a certain being in a major manner, and we are going to ponder and consider the joy that is causing. It just seems intuitively very perverse thing to do. And ethically, it's just, I, I, I've always found that very surprising. Um, but well, yeah. 
I just I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so something that uh, it's, I, I'm moving in part to, to your work now, but of course, this is not exclusively about your work. It has something very central in ecofeminism, which is that it is a relational approach. And this is very related to the question of context. One could say, I have here context based relational approaches. The, the one thing that comes from this perhaps more liberal uh, thinking is that they seek, as you said, for universal principles to have a very robust normative stance. Because one could argue, well, there are some violent practices such as discrimination due to race that are wrong, regardless of context. So one could say, well, what does context have anything, any role to play here? So I just feel curious how you would respond to this challenge. And I want to make clear that I'm asking this question as someone who endorses ecofeminism and the contextual relational approach. But um, yeah, I think it's a challenge that is important. I'm, and given that we, we have you here, it would be wonderful to, to, to hear your response to that. Right, so there is a way in which um, the advocating context, or let's, let's use a, a very specific example, contextual moral veganism. This is an mm -hmm. idea that's central to ecofeminism. It's an idea that actually was um, developed first in the 90s um, by, mm -hmm. Dean Curt by Dean Curtin. And it's a really important idea um, because it, what it suggests is that um, veganism cannot be an absolute principle that one asserts from a view from nowhere, from an outside perspective, because to some extent, context is going to have to play a role um, in our practical understanding and our practical lives. So I always like to think of it in terms of, do we want to use more fossil fuel to fly tofu to the, to the you know, climates, the Arctic that used to be um, quite cold and still pretty cold, um, rather than having um, native populations engage in sustainable um, hunting practices. If you can't grow your own food um, and because of the climate, for example, um, then what are you going to eat? And I think the idea that somehow we're telling some people that they can, because it's easy for us um, to live in the, in, um, where we live to eat non-animal, to eat non-animals or to eat plant-based foods. Um, I think that's one thing, but I think there are gonna be many places, and this is Dean's point, um, where that's not gonna be possible. And so we need to think, what would it mean to be in a fundamentally sustainable and valuable relationship with others in that context. And that's not an easy, I don't say that lightly. I, I mean, I've, I have a lot that I've written about um, whale hunting. I think there's, I, I don't uh, agree with it. And I think that there's a lot to think about in terms of how we manage sort of these kind of contextual harms that are going to occur. But I think it's important that we recognize that there is, we, we all should be doing the very best we can given our context. Mm -hmm. And that I think would allow um, for different kinds of relationships that may not be fully um, flourishing for all of the individuals in that um, context. And so I'm, I think importantly, con focusing on context um, is difficult, it's challenging, uh, but you know what? Our, our relationships and our world is really difficult and challenging. And if we think we could just have a principle that we pull out of the air and plop down in every situation, we're not only doing a certain kind of conceptual violence to the reality of our lived experiences and our relationships with others, but we're also actually failing to capture and understand um, what is at stake in various contexts. So I wanna go back to the example that you used. We live in an anti-Black world. It doesn't, that doesn't change by context, unfortunately. And this is one of the central features, I think, of understanding these value dualisms or these value binaries um, mm -hmm. that I talked about at the beginning. Um, Anti-Blackness is structural. It's foundational to capital societies, to capitalist sort of accumulation. And so it doesn't matter. It's not going to be that in some contexts, that's going to be an okay thing. That's not the level at which the context comes into play. Um, 
because it's in every context. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't actually make sense in some contexts. Um, and maybe I'm wrong about, I mean, I'm open to further discussion about whether the context of sort of living in places where you can't grow plants um, is, is one of those contexts too. Um, I think it's a hard question, but I think in the case of race, it's it's pretty, it's very clear. If you think about colonialism and if you think about anti-Black racism, um, you end up in a situation where if you dig at that, you can really understand that this is a foundational category of exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really gonna change based on context, given the fundamental structures. I, I also must perhaps add to what you are saying, um, and the, one of the key features of ecofeminism is that one thinks of context in terms of, you know, my specific community, my actual relationships, but also in historical terms. So one could think in our historically situated present, racism is a structural force that is permeating our political system, our legal system, our economic system, and so on. So. It just depends what we mean by context in different contexts, I suppose. But yes, I just was thinking it's not perhaps um, they don't contradict each other. I don't see attention in thinking of history in this more structural sense, which is central to ecofeminism, because it's another critique perhaps sometimes that comes not only ecofeminism, but also feminism, that it does not take into account a structural problems. And it's not true. Like if one reads that literature, that's not the case, as you are clearly saying now. Um, and something I really liked about what you said, and I wanted to sort of flag that up or highlight it, is this, because it's one of my main concerns with some deontological approaches, and certainly with singles utilitarianism, and this idea that ethics is difficult. And that's what a very feminist thing to say, that our everyday lives, every action that we do, there is where politics and ethics is present. And we need to live with and through that kind of form of existence, rather than Oh, I've already made my decision, which is I just follow what the utilitarian calculus says. End of the story. That's all that we, one needs to decide. Um, so I, I'm so sympathetic to everything, everything you said. Thank you for, for that, Lori. Um, the, the, the next question I had here prepared was more related now to your work um, and the idea of entangled empathy that links very well with all this discussion we've had on relationality. So a central concern in your writings has been empathy and more concretely, how to take the perspective of another accurately, especially in, in entangled empathy, of course. Um, and it seems to me that an ethic of care that you had already written before writing this book about it has probably motivated why you have thought so carefully about empathy. So I just wanted to Ask you because this is a bit self-indulgent in some way because I really wanted to. I have felt very curious. Oh, now that I have the chance, I want to ask Glory. In how did an ethic of care influence you to to reach and to put entangled empathy at the center of your work in such a strong way? Um, if you could tell us about that, please. <laughs> yes, I'm, I want to just apologize. I have some dogs barking in the background. I'm hoping they will stop barking. I think that means there's a. We dog love in animals. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope it's not too distracting. Um, so um, an ethic of care is um, a really, so it's often misunderstood also, an ethic of care is actually understood in, I should say, a variety of ways. And part of the idea, um, excuse me, one <laughs> One second. But don't worry at all, Lori, it's totally fine. I just, I just wanted to close that door. Okay, so an ethic of care, part of it is that Eli's talking and when he talks, I'm listening and so I can't think when, when he does that. So um, an ethic of care is, was originally um, developed in part as an alternative to some of these more abstract universalistic um, ethical theories like utilitarianism and Kantianism and deontology more broadly. And an ethics of care, um, is, there's different versions of it, but an ethics of care as I understood it, and I think about here, um, the notion of radical care. Um, and it's so it's not 
just about caregiving or caretaking, but it's also about reformulating our understanding of the relationships that we're in, highlighting or making primary um, that our relationships are good relationships when they're caring relationships. And also that care is a sustaining force for making political change. So there's a, I'm, I'm highlighting that because I want to make clear that I think an ethical of care, even though some versions of it um, are less political, there are some ethics of care that are highly political that recognize that, um, as I just said, that care is a real foundational and important um, way of engaging with others, both human and non-human in the world. And so an ethics of care for me um, is a really important way of thinking about um, not just sort of our relationships, but our political framework. Um, and so it was very much a central part of my thinking um, when I developed the view of entangled empathy. Um, ethics of care does in many ways stand in contrast to some of the problematic features of um, these other ethical theories. And um, to think about it in the way, one way, for example, that Alice Crary thinks about it, um, and Cora Diamond think about it, um, mm. for example, is that care is inside ethics, if you, if you will. It's not something outside that comes and forces you to follow something. It, ethics emerges through our relations and our care. They wouldn't agree with that framing exactly, but that's how I think of it. Um, ethics comes from our, our caring um, concerns and relations. It does, it's not something that's imposed from outside. And ultimately for me, I got to thinking about this because I thought, you know, Peter Singer wrote Animal Liberation in, in the seventies. There were some Oxford scholars that, um, you, women who influenced his writing. Um, but even there, we were still not doing well in our relationships with animals. So I started thinking, well, this, these outside theories aren't motivating people. What would be more motivating? Well, what would be more motivating is just looking at what we do in our in our day to day lives and the value we see. Um, here's a here's a really great example of what I take to be inside um, ethics. I was talking to a friend about a book I was reviewing on animal dreams, and I was I thought, oh, this is a really interesting important idea and it's all very technical and we need science and brain science to tell us whether animals dream. And my friend who's not an animal person said, you just see animals dream. What do you, what do you mean? You just look at, you just watch, what? Why do you have all this apparatus to try to establish that animals dream when we just look and we see when our animal, animals we know are moving in their sleep and making vocalizations and whatnot? Of course they're dreaming. So there's a sense in which the, the external theories are theories that come from outside and are put onto us. And then we follow those principles. Whereas a different, a whole different framework for thinking about ethics is to think about it as inside. Like this is what we're gonna be. We're gonna be engaged in looking at animals, being with animals, uncaring about animals, caring about each other, watching animals care for other animals, all of that is going to really help shape um, our ethical um, sensibilities. It, what you're saying makes me think, well, the first thing that makes me think is about a friend of mine, who I think he's in the audience actually, but um, I have the feeling he would probably respond well. And I know you've confronted this challenge in your work. What happens with those we will never meet? What happens, do, do we really care about those people? And something I was thinking now listening to you is that we can think about ethics from the inside or even coming from below as it were, also as being earthlings. Um, and you in the Animal Ladies chapter, Not to Lobotomies, in the last pages that I'm very fond of, I've read them many times, you kind of develop the notion of entanglement and relationality in a way that I didn't see as present in entangled empathy because it was a different context. We've, we've talked about this before. Um, and what, what one sees in those pages is that you start to look at, I'm thinking of relationality about people that might be in India, uh, workers that might be in China and then we buy a product. And we are in that sense entangled in this kind of material socioeconomic man as well. 
Um, so I just wondered if you could perhaps tell us a bit more about this. Because I, yeah. Great question. I mean, I think it's really important to understand um, our relations in global, you know, late capitalism. It's um, we're in uh, unbelievably entangled and problematic relations with um, people that we will never meet because they are. Uh, the example I often use is, you know, these are people and also animals um, in Borneo and Sumatra. Um, that are being decimated by the palm oil industry and the extraction of, you know, the, the burning of the forests, the planting of monocropping um, palm trees and the extraction of, of palm oil that's in virtually all of the products we use. It's really impossible. Well, that's not true. It's nearly impossible to find products these days that aren't, um, that have some palm oil in them. And I'm, I mean that both household products, food products, vegan products, it's everywhere. And so part of what I think is really important is that when we purchase things in this entangled system, um, we are participating, not the same way as somebody who maybe is shoots the orangutan mother as her infant falls. We're not, that our responsibility, our connection to that horror is maybe a little more mediated farther away on this large sort of web of um, interconnection and entanglement. But I think that it's nonetheless um, a relationship. It, it might be a little bit farther away from our my relationship with my dogs. Um, but I think that um, it's nonetheless a relationship that we need to take account of. Now that and, and I think there's a lot of cases like, like this, workers um, who are working under ridiculously awful conditions to make cheap products that we can purchase, um, animals that are being uh, f killed or forced to flee their homes in all parts of the world as various, their, their homes are being extracted for um, consumption. And so I think that the idea is that we are in these webs of relation and we need to attend to them. Now that's not easy. I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting that, that I have the easy solution to the problem of sort of planetary crisis. I do not, I'm very pessimistic, but I do think we need to think differently. And I think that we can think differently. Um, and I think that um, entangled empathy is one tool for thinking differently. The difficulty of reality you were mentioning, Cora Diamond, before it came to mind now. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps here, it's a good moment perhaps to ask, you were mentioned before affect, and certainly affect is very bound or entangled actually with empathy. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit about how these notions are constituted perhaps? Um, yeah, so, so empathy, Empathy is the kind of thing that is both really sort of everybody knows what that is and nobody knows what that is. Um, and so um, one of the things that I think is really important about thinking about empathy, as I like to think of it, is that it's not just a feeling of re reaction. It's not just a um, kind of emotional uh, response that it actually involves a lot of sort of a, a certain kind of dialectic that goes hmm. um, where I might initially respond empathetically to another. Then I have to suss out um, whether or not my reaction is appropriate. And so I have to use all of the resources available to me, my body, my brain, my, my feelings, all of that has to come into play when I'm trying to understand um, what's happening with another. Um, I would want to understand the context if I can as well. So I want to look at, you know, was this, you know, two day old calf taken from their mother? Are they freaking out because they were taken from their mother? Are they freaking out because they've been transported? Are they freaking out because they don't have any other animals around them? I want to figure all that sort of thing out to understand what's the next step? What should I do? Um, and I think that that's part of how I understand empathy. It's not just... Um, a reaction. It's a process where um, there's also a back and forth between me and the one who um, I'm empathizing with. If they can talk, they can correct me. If they um, speak in movement, I can try to understand that. And the idea then is that part of what's happening 
is that I'm not trying to get perfect understanding of another. That's not the goal. Um, a lot of people have often said, oh, you can never really fully understand or completely understand another. So this is a bad theory. I've never suggested that we could under fully understand another. And let me just say, I bet most of us don't fully understand ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the idea is not about full understanding, but about trying to get, take in what is what it is that matters to the other. Um, and trying to get a, get a handle on on what um, they're confronting. In fact, you say explicitly in the animal ladies chapter, um, what was it? Um, yes, that often what happens is that when one thinks, oh, we cannot understand another, we stop there. We then don't try to really get into the shoes of those who might not wear shoes, as you say. So I think that's, it's so important that we always try without being at the same time aware, of course, that um, it's impossible to fully know, but we still need to try and do our best, as you were saying before. Fantastic. I want to add one, yeah, one on. other thing about that. Um, we can also get it wrong. And I think that humility is a really a, another central affect or sort of blend of cognition and emotion that I think is a really important thing to always have in mind. And this, mm -hmm. I think, also speaks against um, these more abstract theories that we started by mm. talking about, that there's, there's sort of a certitude or a certainty that isn't really warranted. And I think having a kind of what I would call epistemic, but also a just empathetic humility, I think is centrally important in making our way in these really complicated um, situations. If I may on that, I think just to, again, to add up to what you're saying, because it speaks to me a lot, and it has always spoken to me a lot from ecofeminism and feminism and post-colonial theory, I think is very important for this, because they, they such an emphasis on um, positionality, on context, on trying to, as, as it were, self-deconstruct oneself, that then uh, it's, you can only be, I mean, I'm not saying that you can only be humble because one can always mess up, but you force yourself to always think, I'm so limited. I have this biography. I'm in this context. What can I know? To, to what extent can I make X or Y judgment and always leave a space for the possibility, of course, of being wrong? Uh, that's uh, it. Speaks to me very much what you what you said. Um, yes. So then, <laughs> then the next question is just you are making me think, and then I <laughs> I need to continue. So it's a bit, uh, but well. Um, my next question is actually about veganism because I know you've supported veganism and you've been a vegan for a long time, whatever that might mean. And an animal advocate, of course, you've been an animal for decades. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how has ecofeminism influenced you in this respect? And also because I, I'm aware that quite a few people are attending this, this talk today, they will be probably vegan as well. So for those who are not familiar with ecofeminism, what is distinctive about, about a contextual ecofeminist veganism? If you could tell us a bit about these two aspects of, of your veganism and contextual ecofeminist veganism, which we have already touched on this, but perhaps you might want to say something else maybe. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I do think that um, it's important to note, like I, I was saying at the beginning, there are some ecofeminists who are not vegan um, or not do not identify as being vegan or do not aspire to being vegan, I, I, um, I think is another way of thinking of it. Um, they don't see um, veganism as being an important part of um, an overall ecofeminist praxis. I think that that's not right. I think increasingly, even though we don't know exactly what the sort of the magnitude of the greenhouse gas emissions from intensive animal agriculture are, there's some debates somewhere between, now they're saying between 15 and 18, something like that. That's a huge amount of uh, greenhouse gases that are um, part and parcel of the mass production of animal bodies and animal um, and animal secretions to consume. So even if you're an ecofeminist that's not interested in veganism, you have to be concerned about the environmental part of the story if you're not concerned about animals. Uh, I think that's a mistake, of course. I think that um, these separations um, are uh, constructs that, that really can't be defended. Um, I think from a, a, from a vegan ecofeminist point of view, though, fundamentally, it, what we see is that we're in these profound relationships with other animals 
um, that we end up exploiting particularly um, cows for milk and hens for eggs. And as um, these, are, these are products that rely on the exploitation of animals' reproductive capacities. And it's a, it's a very significant exploitation that's happening. And um, that itself should cause feminists more generally to be concerned. Mm -hmm. um, Ecofeminists, of course, in particular, should be um, concerned as well. Um, and I think that I, I think that um, ecofeminists, at least ecofeminist contextual veganism, as I said earlier, it really importantly focuses us on whether or not we are able or willing to accept being in relationship with other bodies, as it were, um, that are relationships of exploitation. And I think that's that's I think the really um, fundamental way of thinking about that. I don't think of other animals that I know as edible. Um, this is something that both Cora Diamond notes, notes and I talk a little bit about in my book, um, Ethics and mm. Animals. There's a category of edibility that seems to have come, up, come about. Some people say it came about when we became hunter gatherers way back when. I'm not really interested in the history so much as I am in the present day. Um, and when you think of another animal as an edible being, um, just, I mean, think about the ways that we think of that, at least historically and in some extraordinarily sexist societies and probably Afghanistan right now, um, women are, are thought to be um, sort of a, a category of non-valuable, right? A non-valuable category. And, what we as an ecofeminist, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't see animals as edible. That's that's the wrong category. It's a category mistake. That's the wrong mm. way of categorizing animals. Um, and I think that it also denies the fundamental nature of their experience, um, their experiences and their relationships with one another. Um, and this, I think the same thing is true in, in extraordinarily sexist societies as well. The category of women becomes a category of um, exploitable, disposable, unvaluable, not worthwhile. And those, those category, those ways of categorizing authorize certain kinds of pretty horrifying practices. And so as political actors, as ecofeminists who are interested in um, imagining a different set of social and political and economic um, relations, Putting, putting beings in categories that mark them as not valuable or disposable, um, it's itself, I think, a huge mistake. Mm. Uh, may I ask on this? Um, because I think you perhaps know that I'm very influenced by the work of Matthew Calarco. And he's one of the people who has advocated the most for this idea of edibility as a, but in a vegan sense, he sees it as we share this, it comes from Plumwood really, Val Plumwood in being prey. For people who are not familiar with this, uh, Val Plumwood is a leading ecofeminist scholar, brilliant thinker, and she was attacked by a co crocodile, literally, and she almost died. As they are, she was literally in the mouth of the crocodile. Um, so in that experience, Val Plumwood, her commitment, because she was already a vegetarian at the time, increased. She saw herself as a vulnerable being who can die, who is mortal, and who shares this fleshiness, this embodiment with other beings. Um, so from that point, I, I, I understand your, I think your argument as being precisely historically and politically, it's even in a way, a strategic argument of saying, well, you know, women are consumable, all the work of by Carol Adams, of course, um, and then one saying perhaps this category is a mistake from a political point of view. Um, I mean, you might be right. I have to, I've never thought of this so much in that manner. But um, the question of edibility to me it, it speaks to me in some respects because it forces us to say we are edible, as in we are vulnerable to be eaten, like other animals are, because we are embodied beings. Which might be a mistake. Uh, the word edible, that that term for contextual reasons, strategic reasons, but I don't know what, whether you have something in mind, if a response or a thought on this. 
Yeah, that's a really important point. And I think you're, you're right to push to clarify, for me to clarify. Um, I'm not suggesting that we can't eat each other, right? Um, as Cora Diamond puts it, we don't. We don't, we don't eat our amputated limbs. It wouldn't cause any harm to do so. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers or if it's come back around, there's this, this um, film called Soylent Green, um, which mm -hmm. involves a, a overpopulated planet um, in which humans become food sources once they, when they die. Um, and I think that's a very different kind of idea to be, to be prey, to be um, the kind of being who can be consumed um, mm -hmm. is a very different idea than being categorized as edible. To be categorized as edible is, so I think that the idea here is not to, so for example, um, to, this is one of the debates that people get into when they're thinking about a certain kind of um, sort of political conflict around whether or not um, sort of, well, we can think of it in, in the context of the US about Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter is making a point um, and so when the police say blue lives matter, um, they're not wrong, it, but they're just missing the politics of what's happening. And so I would say in this context too, um, just to think, well, I can be eaten, so I'm also edible is to miss what I'm, what the critique of edibility is. Of it's a category of, mm -hmm. it's like a category I say, this is your primary role is to be eaten um, and, mm -hmm. That's not to say that you can't eat humans. We don't usually, but that's that's what I'm getting at is, a, is the way of mm -hmm. conceptualizing and framing the relationship as one of consumer and consumable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's, I, I hope that that makes it clearer. That, that helps a lot. Actually in my work and other people have used this terminology, but I like to say that concepts and words, they have a certain force that is historically situated, politically situated. And if they do, I think you are very right. And I, I, because I, I'm close to the work of Matthew Carrara, I have not, but I think you've convinced me that the word edibility today, at least, has that force that produces or makes us think and see others as consumable beings that are killable. There is, so I think you are, yes, I think you're very and right. I, I think here is a really important point, um, and mm. it's work I'm doing lately, um, is, and that is that there's a sense in which a lot of the um, animal ethics as we normally understand it is disconnected from larger, I, I'm not saying you do this public because I don't think you do, but it's, it's disconnected from sort of larger traditions in critical social thought and critical mm -hmm. social theory. And when you look at the notion of edibility, consumability, and the concept and the role the concept plays, you need to think about ideology. And you need yep. to think about the way that ideology shapes or hides certain kinds of relations. And so part of what happens when you bring these categories to the fore is you then say, oh my goodness, this is a part of an ideology that allows me to put myself above other animals and to think of them merely as foodstuff. I mean, I'm amazed all the time at how many really tremendously smart, engaged, political, wonderful people think cows make milk naturally, right? It's just like, no, cows have to be impregnated. And part of it is because of an ideology um, that we have that there's such a thing as a dairy cow. What's a dairy cow? No, there's no, dairy, there's no such thing as dairy cow, but we then come to believe, oh yeah, there's a dairy cow because we made these things and there's an ideology that allows us to imagine that there are cows that make milk. That's what they do, but that's not at all the case. That's an ideology and it's an ideology that's in practice, right? But um, I think that's an important feature. Yes, I just agree with everything you said. And this has led us to have five minutes left only for the kind of future of ecofeminism part, but it's okay. I, I really enjoyed this discussion. So uh, let's try to move on these ones relatively quickly. So the first thing um, that I wanted to ask was that, well, 
something that Josephine Donovan and Carol Adams say in the feminist Greta tradition in animal ethics is that, and you've mentioned this before in relation to your dog friends, that you were listening to them because they actually speak and they talk to you, right? So this was already the very present. They have this wonderful quote that often quoted and one of my favorite ones that says that we should listening, listen to animals rather than what other humans are telling us about them. And that the question I wanted to ask you is, how can human and non-human animals co-author the next ecofeminist steps with each other? So the idea of we put animal voices at the center and how do we do that from an ecofeminist point of view? So I think um, I think it's a really, I, I mean, I, I have a lot of things to say about this, but um, so I think on the one hand, absolutely, what we need to be doing is, as I've been saying all along, is um, engaging with other animals and um, having their experiences and their um, relationships with us, with the other animals, um, as a central part of how it is that we sort of imagine um, what some people call multi-species um, communities. Um, I don't love the idea of co-authoring with other animals. Mm. Maybe it's because I do a lot of co-authoring and it's really hard and it's hard to get everybody's voice there. I Anyway, just, I just want to kind of critically push back on the idea of co-authoring um, with other animals. But I do think fundamentally we need to really heighten our relationships in thinking about um, what, um, what they might want and what they might um, be engaged in um, doing. And I think that the idea is that um, we know too little about um, we well, we know too little about what they might do in our absence. I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I've been thinking about how it is that, you know, we are shaping all this for them, but what would they do without us? I guess that's the, that's what I'm pushing back in. Mm -hmm. Like would co-authoring mean that we're kind of conscripting them into our theories? Yes, it would. And would they really want to do that? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, and so I do think that there's an important sense in which um, figuring out what it would mean for animals to do what they do, and maybe practicing some of that ourselves, um, could be a really useful and also, I think, humbling um, experience. So that's, that's just one thought. Um, I do think that though, uh, just to reiterate what I said earlier, listening to animals is fundamentally important. Um, it's a different orientation than an orientation of ex outside ethics or above and out, you know, our theories are gonna shape how we understand this. I, I, I was asked many years ago to write an introductory book on animal minds and been teaching about animal minds for ages. But if you think about what animal minds as a field um, looks like, it's really about how do these theories apply to animals? How do we understand mm -hmm. their minds? We have these theories of how our minds work, do animals' minds work that way? And I wanna say that's the wrong set of questions. And so I ended up not writing that book because it, it's not a book that, well, that they wanted ultimately, but it's not, a, we, we're not, we're not gonna really understand animals fully um, or well if, if we're using our theoretical constructs and concepts, um, they may not have those constructs and concepts. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna miss out um, on that. Yeah. So anyway, I'm pushing back against that <laughs> question. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. No, that's totally fine. I just, I mean, there is no time to discuss this now, but I just think that the notion of co-authoring um, and listening to animals first, I'm from the build a political system, think about ethics. Um, the way I see it, I don't. I, to me, it makes a lot of sense, but I mean, there is no time not to get into that perhaps. But um, the, the, the next question was more related to the field, the fields of ecofeminism and critical animal studies. So you are a leading figure of both fields, the leading author and thinker, and you've built it in a way, one of the pe people who has co-authored these fields. So where do you see us going? What do you think next we should be focusing on? What is important? And um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's not surprising or, or um, hard to imagine. We're in, a, we're in a crisis. I mean, our planet is in a crisis and 
um, if we don't attend to um, the ways of mass destruction um, that and the mass violence that's occurring, um, we won't have um, any theories to be talking about or any praxis to be engaged in because um, we're really at a crisis moment. And I think importantly, we need to, um, I mean, some people have suggested we need a moral revolution. I think we just need a plain old revolution. I think the idea is that um, if we don't work against the mass violence and mass destruction of our homes and the homes of so many, um, we're, we're really in trouble. So Extinction Rebellion work, um, supporting those who are working in, in ways to really um, throw um, wrenches into this into the system, I think is really important. And I guess another way of putting that then is that a lot of what I think needs to happen in both ecofeminism and critical animal studies is that we need to fundamentally um, focus on politics. And I don't mean the political turn in animal mm -hmm. ethics, which is a more sort of sort of a liberal view, let's fix the system in this way or that way. I mean, really thinking about um, what an important, uh, there's a, a wonderfully important set of um, black thinkers who are, talk about this intergenerational laceration that um, black people um, live with and experience, um, but go on, right? But continue to go on. And I think that um, we need to really fight against the ways in which um, late capital and corrupt politics um, in the sort of mainstream way um, are destroying our world. Actually, we will have uh, one conversation, the next one, with Dines Wadiwal and Kletzin Kim. So we're going to touch on some of the things you mentioned. And also with Jan Dutkiewicz and Katie Gillespie, Catherine Gillespie on animal agriculture. So we're going to touch on some of these topics they're mentioning now in more depth in our next conversations. And before we go to the Q&A, Laurie, what are you working on at the moment? I know that many people in the audience, they have at least some colleagues of mine, they really wanted to know. And what are you going to publish in the coming year to years? Because I know that you're always working in so many books and publishing so many things. If you could tell us a little bit about it, please. Well, um, so there's two, so in addition to the um, second edition of Ecofeminism and the second edition of Ethics and Animals that are both coming out uh, soon, Ethics and Animals second edition should be out in the next few months and so should Ecofeminism, um, the second edition. Um, there's two other book projects that I'm finishing up on. One is a, a really important, it's an edited work, but it's, um, it's really looking at what um, I call the carceral turn in, um, animal activism, and it's critical of a certain set, uh, the book itself is critical of a certain way in which animal activists have become increasingly interested in um, lock them up mentality. And so um, that's a book um, that will be coming out from Cambridge probably next year. And then the other um, thing, which is very much what I've been talking about today uh, or it's seeping into our conversation um, is a volume um, that I, a book that I've written with Alice Crary called um, Animal Crisis. And that should be coming out. That'll be a short book. Um, and it's a book that's designed to sort of motivate the political sort of activism that I'm, or at least undergird it with certain conceptual foundations that I've been talking about. Um, and then, so partly um, there, there's a lot of ideas that I have about the intersection of um, car mass incarceration, anti-Blackness, um, cap animal captives, and of course, entangled empathy that I'm thinking about um, trying to put together in a way that might be um, accessible. So I'm interested in thinking about um, different contexts in which entangled empathy may um, provide insights, um, prisons, slaughterhouses, and zoos. Um, so I'm thinking about um, that volume, maybe writing that next. Oh, that sounds amazing. Actually, I really enjoyed it, your book, The Ethics of Captivity, if people are interested. Um, in this topic, they should. I, I would have also liked to ask you, actually, I thought about it, your work in prisons. I know that you have taught in prisons for a long time and thought about this very carefully, and carceral logics as well. It's just 
you have as much time as we have, but yes. uh, it's such an interesting topic. So there, there is a first question that I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly by Helen Kopnina, who is a leading compassionate conservationist. And she's asking um, about ecofeminism's uh, relational approach. And what does it say about a species ranking? So a child versus bacteria, for example, um, or beings uh, who are important for ecosystem functioning, such as earthworms uh, versus ourselves, um, that you know uh, we might be detrimental to ecosystem functioning. Or earthworms might be very important. Um, so, how does an ecofeminist relational approach respond to, to this kind of question? So, I, if I understand what you asked, I think the hmm. idea um, is so. Ecofeminists are opposed to hierarchies. Um, and the reason that we're opposed to hierarchies is because hierarchical organization um, is hierarchical thinking is what um, undergirds, if, it, if you will, or supports um, certain kinds of oppressive structures. And so hierarchical thinking isn't something um, that as a, as a categorical notion, isn't something that ecofeminists would accept. Um, however, you know, whenever you're in a particular context and you have to make certain kinds of determinations about you know, how, to, how to address various problems, there's gonna be different kinds of um, concerns that are relevant in the context. So there's no way to really say in advance um, whether or not you, you know, some, some organism is more valuable across the board than some other organism because it's largely going to depend on, on um, what the situation looks like. I don't think that's a very good answer, but I would need a context to be able to explain it better. Um, but I think that the main important point is that we really need to challenge our kind of what we've been taught and how, the, how ideologically we're thinking about hierarchy. Um, hierarchies are set up um, and have been set up historically to exclude certain others that are deemed less valuable and to, if you will, excuse the technical term, reify that lack of value. And so I think it's important um, to really challenge how we've come to understand these hierarchical hierarchical relations. And I should not answer the question so long. I'm sorry, I'll be shorter. <laughs> totally fine, Lori. No worries at all. And I should have said, um, sorry that I jumped to the question so quickly, but I was trying to catch the question while you were talking. Uh, for people who are on Zoom, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand and we might let you just ask a question live. That's also a possibility if some of you uh, were wanted to do that. In the meantime, I want to ask the second question by Deborah Lege, who is asking, um, Laurie, could you, uh, well, how, how um, you, would you answer to this kind of challenge that um, animal theorists argue that environmental and animal ethics, environmental ethics and animal ethics are in conflict and cannot be reconciled? Um, how would you respond to that? Um, so it, this points to a longstanding um, argument that has been going on since the 80s, um, that, that environmental ethics and animal ethics are a bad marriage, quick divorce, I think is one of the early articles. Marty Keel wrote a beautiful piece way back when, very important, very inspirational for me, very inspirational for me, um, in which she talked about um, how animal ethics and environmental ethics aren't in a triangular relationship, which is again, this is this is J. Baird Callicott's initial idea. He's moved away from it, but that he thought that animal active animal ethics and environmental ethics were at odds. Marty mm -hmm. um, suggested that it's a circular affair. That was the title of her early environmental ethics article. Um, and it is, um, I and Dale Jameson has also written really well about the ways in which animal ethics and environmental ethics are not at odds. If you look at traditional animal ethics and you look at some of the earlier, more holistic environmental ethics, then you do see a conflict there. But ecofeminists and the way that we've organized our thinking about ethics makes it so these things aren't at odds. Now, having said that, and I said I was gonna be short, I'm sorry, I'm going back on my word, but I do wanna say one thing. Um, 
I've gotten a lot of flack for not including plants in entangled empathy, not including um, ecosystems. And I wanna say why, and I am still working on it. So um, maybe I'll change my views, but um, I think that in order to empathize with another, you have to have a perspective that can be taken and understood. Um, and I don't think that plants and ecosystems have perspectives. Um, that doesn't mean they're not valuable. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're not in very important relations with our natural spaces. Um, but I do think it's difficult to say that we empathize with them. I would have to say similarly, maybe in relation to the question that was asked previously, I think that's probably also true of certain organisms um, beyond plants, but, but that it's, it's hard. Um, we might not empathize with them, but we might be able to do that in a metaphorical way. And that's not nothing. Lori, may I ask about this? Um, if, well, one might raise the concern then, and perhaps, I don't know, of, well, if we cannot empathize with certain forms of life, would that create a hierarchy between those beings who we can empathize, who we can empathize with and those that we cannot empathize with. Because, you know, I'm also thinking here of fists, say some fists, we, we might find it really difficult to empathize in some cases. Um, so I, I, I don't know, what do you, what do you say about that? So there's two things I wouldn't want to say. One is that, um, that it's difficult to empathize with someone with a perspective is true and you just have to work at it. So it's difficult to empathize with octopus, so go watch Octopus Teacher and you will get better insight into how to empathize with octopus, right? Um, or fish or what have you. Um, so those are, those are beings that have a perspective. And if you're, if you're um, unable to um, sort of, if it's difficult to empathize, you just have to work at it harder. Mm -hmm. um, the, the point I'm making is there are, there are, it makes sense to say there are beings that don't have perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to categorize which ones those are, but I think that's true. Um, mm. And so I think the hierarchy point or the binary point, um, you have to think about the way that I'm thinking and the way that ecofeminists think about dualism, value dualism and hierarchy is conceptual, historical, philosophical. Mm -hmm. It's not just making a distinction between off and on. That's a distinction we can make. It's the computer's off, the computer's on. It's not to say that there can't be any binaries. Um, it's that there are certain value binaries that constrain our actions, constrain our thinking and reproduce socially and politically um, exploitation. Uh, or domination. So that's the that's that's the hierarchy. Hierarchies do that naturally, um, because hierarchies are value hierarchies. But dualisms aren't all value dualisms. I hope that's okay. thank you. No, that's that's very clear and yeah, persuasive. <laughs> um, Loop Claudio. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the surname correctly. Uh, she asks. I find the idea of contextual veganism problematic. Would you make the same point of contextual slavery abolitionism if one depends solely on products made by slaves? So um, this is a kind of a, a strange kind of comparison, I think. Um, and there's a lot I could say. I, I, I think I do have, um, I, I wrote a, a paper um, many years ago. It's very short, um, but it, it's about conflicting values in a conflicted world. Um, and it's really about understanding sort of who's in the community and who's out of the community and what kinds of claims we can make. Um, and if you use others, um, there has to be, um, I, I, I understand the tension. I really do understand the tension here, but um, there, the idea of anti-Black racism um, that, upheld this question of, of slavery is one that is fundamentally um, problematic. There's, there's, no, uh, there's, no, there's no way of upholding that. Um, and so the idea that I was saying about contextual moral veganism is that, so it, the question becomes a question of 
Um, if, if people, for example, who are living in places where um, the tundra is such that you can't grow food, um, what, what are we supposed to do about that? Um, in the case of slavery, there's other people who could work. It's not, it, it doesn't, so I guess what I'm getting at is there's a sense in which there's some context in which um, people and animals need to eat and there's nothing else to eat other than each other. Um, and, but that's not the same with labor. I don't think that's the same with labor. Um, so I think it's a disanalogy. I, 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 I feel like that's, um, yeah, it's a, hard, it's a hard connection to make for me there. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm just thinking it's, yeah, it's, it's, oh, well, let's move to the next question then. So Maria, I just want, want, oh, want go on. I mean, so, I mean, slavery is extraction of labor, right? It's the sort of the stealing of a person's labor, which is, and, and you might say that, yes, in the case of the Arctic, you're stealing another's life. You could say that. Um, but I think there's a, there's a case in which it's, when you're in a self-defense situation, I guess that's the, the other way of thinking of it, um, you, you have to pay attention to that. And that's not the case with labor. Yes. Um... The next question is by Maria Martelli, who asks, how does ecofeminism sub subvert the binary gender categories and how does it relate to queerness? Uh, she's from Romania and thanks you as well for the discussion. It's, oh, it's, I'm so glad you raised that question. It's such an important question. There's, a, I mean, I have it written down that I wanted to talk about it. And so thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, Maria, that's, it's so important. So as I said at the very beginning, and I, I should have come back to this, um, in the early days of ecofeminism, um, a lot of, I mean, obviously there was, there was, were, there were queer people were involved in ecofeminism very early on. Um, Feminist for Animal Rights was mostly what we would call a queer organization, lesbian organization. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that that was a central part of it. But as gender, um, as gender ideology has become more um, explored and analyzed and understood, um, ecofeminism has moved in the same way as much feminism has, which is to recognize that, oh my gosh, right, there is a way in which being assigned a particular gender, it, and it's a binary gender, is another part of the ideological construction of um, dominating and domin and domin forms of domination in human relationships. And so importantly, um, there's an, a, a very real sense in which um, queering ecofeminism is a, a, a central part of what it is that ecofeminists are open to doing. And as I said earlier in ecofeminism, um, the volume, we're in, we've included a number of different um, chapters that address just these kinds of questions. Um, there's an unfortunate sense in which, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, um, people somehow thought that ecofeminism was essentialist. It gets replicated over and over for decades. People keep saying, oh, it's essentialist. It never really was essentialist. I don't understand. There were debates about how do you feel about this or that, but there was no, not really any ever, ever essentialism that was a part of um, ecofeminism. And by essentialism, I mean the idea that women are essentially closer to nature or women are essentially, you know, caregivers and men are essentially closer to culture or men are provider. I don't know any ecofeminists who would who believe that to be true. Although a lot of people who resist ecofeminism seem to put that on us. I, I, I never, I've never met somebody who actually believes in essentialism in that way. Um, but in any event, like most theories over 50 years, um, there's been a lot of important developments, nuances, changes that have happened. And I think that 
um, gender categories and gender binaries are just as problematic as all the other binaries when they come when it comes to being value a value dualism. Um, I think most of the ecofeminists I know recognize that gender is on a very sort of wide continuum. Um, and uh, there's a lot that we could say about that, but there's a lot of material in the book as well to look at. Fantastic. The next question is really wrong, really long, because I was reading now another one that had the word wrong there. Um, well, I'm not going to read the whole of it because it's just, there is a long quote by you, Laurie, if you want to take a look. And then the, the, the person asking the question, Anastasia, says whether um, you would be willing to abandon veganism in favor of ethical meat eating, I guess it's kind of welfareism in certain, oh no, in certain contexts, like in climates where soy cannot be grown. And then she says, doesn't this avoidance of fossil fuels made from dead animals then privilege those over the lives of current animals? Mm. That's um, the question. Okay, I'm not sure I fully understand the fossil fuel question, part of the question. Mm, exactly. um, the, the idea, I think what I was suggesting um, is that we are, our, our planet's on fire. I mean, we're in, we're in crisis. I don't want to mince words here. Um, I don't, I, I'm not talking about using animals in the past and then their fossil remains becoming fuel. I'm thinking about greenhouse gas emissions. I'm thinking about travel. I'm thinking about shipping. I'm thinking about global markets. I'm thinking about the ways in which um, the sort of forces of um, extraction and consumption have are putting us and so many animals um, on the brink. And so contributing to the quickening demise of our home is something we really need to attend to. And um, so when we can minimize um, engaging in consumption of those things, beings, stuff that is contributing to greater um, greenhouse gas emissions that is are causing all these really profound problems, we ought to do that. That's what I'm thinking about in that case. Um, and so um, would, I, I, and then there's the vegan question, would I eat other animals? I couldn't do it, no. Um, that's not, but that's a different sort of question, I think, than whether or not it's um, in matters of, as I said earlier, self-defense, one is justified or um, the relation can be, can happen. I mean, I'm imagining that, I mean, so just so that it's not species, what people call speciesist or human-centered or anthropocentric, or however you want to use the term, um, you know, if a polar bear eats a, a person, that's the same kind of thing. It's not, I'm not gonna go in and say that that polar bear shouldn't eat the person. Um, so that's, I guess what I'm getting at. I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you, Laurie. And then there is this question by Darius Zira, who says, there is no ethics without hierarchies. Laurie rightly thinks that plants don't have a perspective. That's a form of valuing and that's okay. Am I wrong? So I'm not quite sure why the, what the idea is about valuing requiring hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I understand that. Um, mm -hmm. The way that I understand valuing is that we're in a variety of relations and we're attending to one another and each other and other beings um, and, and engaging as best we can with their sensitivities, their needs, their interests, their desires, their relationships, what would, um, what would be helpful to them, what would be fun for them, what would be loving towards them, what would be caring towards them. That's how I think of ethics. So I don't see that as hierarchical and I'm not sure. I think that it's true that the traditional theories are certainly hierarchical, but I don't think all ethics is traditional ethics. So I guess that's, um, that's one of the ideas. Um, and I'd love to be told that, I mean, I've done a lot of reading on plants. I'm actually reading a paper right now for 
um, on plant empathy. Um, I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying definitively that plants and ecosystems don't have perspectives. I just haven't been taught or understood what those perspectives look like. And if somebody, I mean, I, I live in, I, I, I live in a wetland and the marsh is the most magical place I've ever been. I adore it here. Um, I, I would fight to defend that march, marsh to the end. <laughs> I was like, this is my marsh. It's not really my marsh, but like, I really love the wetlands and, um, and I care about the wetlands and I don't empathize with them, but I, I really, I will defend them. Um, so I don't know if that helps. Actually, I, I was thinking while you were speaking that something that at least it helped me a lot to understand what you meant is that perhaps there is a slight confusion with the word hierarchy because uh, Darius would seem to use the word hierarchy in a more perhaps um, a contextual or a historical sense. You know, there is something above, something below. But the way that you are referring to it, and the feminist labor group would refer to it, is historically situated. It's binaries that are going to structure our political system now in this context. Um, that there is a power dynamic going on there hierarchically and so on. And so I, I think there is at least a difference of understanding of hierarchy, perhaps, in the question and. But then the Andrea Theron, um, she was asking whether perspective refers to agency. Oh, that's a really, really good question. No, I don't think it does. Um, I think that agency is, there's, I have a lot of different thoughts about agency. Um, I, but I don't think that one need, and it would depend largely on what we mean by agency. Um, but I think perspective is not necessarily tied to agency. Um, if by agency we mean um, an agent is someone who thinks about their actions, right? Which is often what people mean by an agent is someone who thinks about their actions. Um, if you think about it in the legal context, for example, you're an agent if you, could have known that you did something wrong um, and you're not an agent if you just acted and didn't know right from wrong or something like that. Um, and so, no, I don't think perspective is the same as agency. If you mean just acting or moving or having some, um, you know, sort of ability to avoid certain kinds of places, um, maybe more so, um, I guess the, the, the important thing for me is, and I guess I should just come, you know, come to grips with this, is that too often those who want to reject um, the very real relationships and experiences and sensitivity of other animals, they compare animals to plants. And that to me is just, to, uh, to really miss out on all sorts of choices and engagement and concerns that other animals have. Um, it might be that if what you mean by agency is the ability to make choices, then I think that plants do, I don't know if they, cog I mean, obviously they cognitively don't make choices, but they, they grow one way or the other. Um, animals do much, much more than that. Um, so I think that animal agency is a more sophisticated version of agency, mm. if that's what's up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. I think we are nearing the end. We only have two minutes left. And I would like to say a few things to wrap up about our next event. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to, to say is that um, the next conversation we are going to have, as I was saying before, we are going to have one conversation every month will be on race, conservation of human dominion over animals with Kledzin Kim, Dean Eswal, Dewell, and Helen Kopnina, the 15th of September. I'm going to share here on the chat uh, the link so that you can register. And then we have this Saturday, I think it is the 21st of August, a wonderful round table entitled Addressing Individual Animal Interests Within the Zoo which will be said by one of our associate members and Clay. So let me also share the link on the chat. One second, there you go. And before 
Yes. And we will have many, many other events, by the way. And we have um, an account on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to say us. If you just search Animals and Biodiversity Global Research Network Think Tank, you will find us there. Uh, we have plenty of things coming up. Um, and Ori, before we finish, um, can you tell us where people can reach you and find more information about your work as well, please? Um, I have a website, uh, lauriegruen.com, um, and I am also on Twitter um, and sometimes. Um, so um, uh, that would be good. And you can find me at Wesleyan too. Um, so um, I, yes, thank you. Perfect. Um, Actually, I, I, I've told you before, Laurie, you should be more active on Twitter because your work is so great. And I, sometimes I miss your your talks or what you're doing just because you don't tweet things. <laughs> Please just do it. I know. And um, yes, before, I'm going to end by reading a few quotes that um, I, every time that we have a conversation, I will read one quote. In this occasion, I will read three short quotes. But before I do that, I, sometimes, you know, when we are having this conversation, or you might have thought that you perhaps had something else you wanted to say, or you might have some hopeful or not so hopeful words about um, the future. I just wanted to give you a last chance to perhaps say something if you if you want to. If not, it's fine. Uh, no, I'm just I'm really thankful for the opportunity. The next set of um, discussions that you have lined up sound fantastic. Maybe I'll come be able to come to that. It would be wonderful if you. Came. And of course, thank you very much again. Um, it's a huge honor to have you with us, Lori. Um, I love your work and it has influenced me a lot. So it's been amazing. Thank you very much for being with us in this first conversation. Thank you. So the quotes I'm going to read to uh, appear in the book, Beasts of Burden, Animal and Disability Liber Liberation uh, by Sonora Taylor, who is a person with a disability. She's also an ecofeminist thinker, uh, an artist, incredible uh, thinker and, and person. And um, of, of these three short quotes I'm going to read, um, which have been in that book, the first one is by Neil Marcus, uh, who is a disabled dancer, artist, and poet. And he says about disability that disability is not a brave struggle or courage in the face of adversity. Disability is an art. It is an ingenious way to live. The second quote is by disability studies scholar, Robert McRua, who asks, what might it mean to welcome the disability to come? And the last one is by Sonora Taylor herself, who says, these sentiments referring to the previous two quotes, challenge us to see the sensuality, the unruliness, the beautiful potential of living alternative ways of moving through space and of being in time. Disability can be liberating, exhilarating, a place of freedom from the continual work our society demands of us to be normal. Now, what is really central, I think, in the quote by Sonora Taylor and the previous ones on disability is difference, which is going to be, if you like, a key principle, perhaps we could call it, maybe there are better terms for it. In any case, difference is certainly going to structure our conversation series on animal justice and animal politics. And the idea is that we are going to celebrate in this space different cosmologies, different voices, sexualities, cultures, ways of understanding one gender, and also different ways to live and be. So I really hope that you will join us in the future. We are going to have many wonderful conversations with wonderful speakers. The first one has been with Lori Gruen and the ecofeminism, which I think should be at the center of the animal movement and animal theory. So one last time, Lori, thank you very much. It's been a huge honor and pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Bye, everybody.